Thank you, Gordon. I just want to thank you guys for the support of the program. It's, as you know, a tremendous program. Hopefully, it continues forever. Thanks. When I signed up for Quest, I wasn't exactly sure what I was getting myself into. I heard that it was a lot of work with the research, the binder, and months of preparation for the trip. What I didn't realize that was that Quest was probably one of the most fun things that I would do all summer. I made so many memories with friends that I had known for years, but I also talked to some people that I never really talked to before. I really can't imagine a better way to get to know someone than to take a flight with them, to spend a week in a hotel with them, or even go to a national park. Quest was a great experience, and I love talking to the people that I went with. As you probably already know, every student for Quest is supposed to find a location to research and become an expert on. The location I decided to become an expert on was Red Rocks Amphitheater. The first thing that caught my attention about Red Rocks was the beautiful views. I couldn't find any other location that would be nearly as awesome as Red Rocks Amphitheater. The nature surrounding the amphitheater was astonishing. The rocks themselves just tower over you as you walk into the amphitheater, and the view of Denver is just amazing. I could go on and on, but being able to travel to a location that I had researched was very cool. As for the other locations we went to, I can't say enough good things about all the places that we went. I think that the opportunity to choose our own destination and research it just added to the experience. For example, if I didn't know that the Beatles, U2, and many other famous bands had performed at Red Rocks, the place that we were, I might not have been so invested in the location. If I had known that hundreds of people went into transforming the side of a cliff into Red Rocks Amphitheater, I wouldn't have been able to appreciate it to the same extent. There aren't many times that I hear me say that I enjoy researching a topic, but that is what I would say about Quest. I learned so much, and I would encourage any students that I know to participate in Quest if possible. I'd also like to take this time to just talk about the destination for last year's Quest trip. There are two main places that I traveled to, which was Denver and Yellowstone. We began in Denver, and it was just amazing. I've been to Denver before since so my aunt and uncle was there, but I didn't really understand how much history was involved there. To be able to learn about the gold mines of Denver and how so many people rushed to Denver to get rich was very interesting. To be able to see up close why Denver is such a historical and side after city was just awesome. The other important location that we traveled to was Yellowstone. Yellowstone alone was probably the main reason that I decided to go on the quest trip last year. As a kid, my parents had taken me to many national parks, such as the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, and Yosemite, but none of those places even compared to the beauty of Yellowstone. The few days that we spent there, it must be that I need to go back there and see more of the park when I get older. What I'm trying to say is that Yellowstone and Denver were just really amazing. I can't imagine any other school district that allows their top performing students to go on a trip like we did with Quest. That's what set Swalton apart from other schools. When I tell people from other schools that I went on a trip with 20 students from my school to Denver and Yellowstone, I can proudly say that I did all of that with people from Walton Verona schools. Plus, it's the most amazing program, and I'm so happy that I was able to go. Thanks for your time. Um, one person. 
we have here is our middle, our middle school uh, technology assistant, that's Lindsey Crumman. Uh, we did add uh, Kristen Gamble into sixth grade math. I don't see Kristen here. And then Carson Mays was our new music teacher this year. Those are our new So I echo the sentiments of uh, you know, Mr. Nash and the people that we've added have been absolutely fantastic. And we have quite a few new names that we've added to elementary, but it's not because of a lot of people moving on or anything like that. We are growing. So um, that is part of it. A couple of them had, uh, were not able to make it, but um, you know, for various reasons. But Angie, <laughs> I, I saw you in here. Angie is. She's returning to us, teaching second grade. We're super thrilled to have her back. Uh, Bailey held. Bailey, make it. Bailey is here. Bailey was one of our student teachers, and she did such a darn good job. Glad we got to keep her around. Uh, Catherine Willis is not able to make it this evening. She's dealing with a family matter. Amanda Watkins, were you able to make it? Uh, she's working in our special education group. Taylor Warnke is a new third grade teacher uh, that's coming to us, but she has a sick child, so she is at home tonight. Katie Napier, <laughs> Katie is our new uh, first coordinator, and Jenny, good note, Jenny, I saw you, there you are. Jenny is working in special education with first grade. Uh, Allie Meese, did Allie, Allie was sick today from work. She's, uh, we've been dealing with some sicknesses over at the elementary school. Pam Saylor is joining us from Grant County. She's working in our NTSS department. Christy Stewart is a kindergarten teacher that is also returning to us um, after a little bit of great service. Uh, Mackenzie, did I say Mackenzie? Mackenzie Spanier is working in our special education uh, department. And then I do have a couple other people that I asked. They were mid-year hires, so Lisa Kinman is here. She is uh, working with our special education and our finance people as a secretary. And then Megan, great. Those are the people on my list. So, uh, a lot of new faces at the elementary school. It's not because we're losing a lot of faces, it's just because we're growing these amounts over there. So, <laughs> I would also like to introduce Robin Engel. She's our new school psychologist at the elementary school. <laughs> um, at the preschool, we did have um, Tara Kors, who's at the elementary school in the cafeteria. She transferred over and is working as an instructional assistant with us. And also, um, just hired last week, I believe, Angela Adams is a new instructional aide working with us. And then we do have Miss Shelby Doctor. She is here with us tonight. <laughs> Um, she's working as one of our new teachers. So Shelby was um, hired at our, or the position was approved at our August board meeting, so she jumped right in. She's been on the fly ever since, but um, she's been wonderful. So that's all we got at the preschool. I would just like to take a moment to echo some comments that our principals made. Those of you that are new employees to the district, um, Many of you know I'm scheduling individual time with each of you to get to know you. It's been a pleasure uh, to get to know those of you who have had, have had the opportunity to meet with so far. If I haven't had the chance to meet with you yet, uh, that's that's coming. Uh, so I look forward to, to getting to know you. And you are the lifeblood of this organization. So I just want to thank you for staying with us. Uh, I, I don't want to leave out uh, Mr. Schaefer. So uh, you have any, anyone you would like to introduce? I do. We have one uh, addition behind the wheel in transportation. This is Ms. Reva Braunwart. She's behind the wheel on bus 14 this year. Came from Kenton County, too. Fantastic. And those new employees, I'll just ask. Megan Jones asked me to say tonight, she is uh, getting married tomorrow. And she is literally at her rehearsal dinner right now. Uh, so she looks forward to meeting all of you and, and regrets that she couldn't attend tonight's meeting. Dr. Baker, one more. Not new to the district, but in a new position is Amber Hedges from the uh, middle school music <laughs> choir teaching position to splitting her time at the elementary and the middle school in a guidance counseling position. All right, so with that being said, at this time, if any of you all 
Megan would normally give you a couple minutes to leave if you don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting. If not, we'll move on with the rest. We will start this up. Uh, <laughs> 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 Mass Exodus, we'll see you later. That being said, we want to start with our elementary report. All right, for the elementary report, um, I am up to my ears right now for data. And those of you that uh, know, me know that I'm loving that, but I didn't want to crush you all with that. So I admittedly kind of pacing myself a little bit with uh, presenting this. So when we get to the November board meeting, I'll have a lot more of a deep dive into our KSA results. Uh, but for tonight, I want to take a look at a couple of things from Matt. Uh, so uh, as I stated at the last board meeting, we pushed back when we were giving that test to align more closely with what Matt's recommendation is in terms of testing windows compared to weeks of instruction that have happened. So we got those results. Um, things look pretty positive uh, at the elementary school in regard to that. So you can see uh, I gave the scores from fall of 2019. So those would be our pre-pandemic scores uh, for MAP, just our RIT uh, results. And over there, up the fifth, sixth column, uh, you can see the plus and minus as we went from 21 to 22. So last year, this year, and then 20 to 22. So two years ago to this year. Um, and for the most part, we are all positive, uh, moving back to where we need to be. Now, in some areas, we're not quite to where we were pre-pandemic, but statistically speaking, we're very, very close. Uh, I'm super pleased with the direction that we're going. And we've increased the distance that we are from the national norm in terms of the red score. So uh, in that regard, things are going in the right direction at the elementary school. Um, that fourth grade group is the group that um, you know, over the past couple of years, you guys have heard me preach about them. They lost that fourth of their first grade year. So, the, you know, spring of 2020, they were first graders. Uh, my teachers hear me preach all the time. First grade is maybe the most critical time in these little ones' lives because we need them leaving the school of leaders. And, and, you know, the entire quarter of the year got sucked out from them. So, as you can see, that is the one, um, you know, we're still making up a little bit of ground on there. but. Uh, we got the right teachers in place. I think with uh, the new curriculum that our teachers are working on with them, um, I'm super pleased. We are having PLCs and meeting with them. The teachers are buying into the new curriculum and they're excited about the direction that we're going. Uh, so I look forward to seeing these things continue to go in the right direction. Uh, the other part is just kind of an early snippet on our KSA, formerly referred to as KPREP results. Um, those results came back pretty good for us. We were a green school, so we were very happy about that. I know you all were already uh, aware of that. Um, the one thing that I want to focus on is uh, that science test specifically. So down there you can see in 2019 we are 37% proficient and distinguished. This year we are at 35%. Um, that is a tough test. The state average is 29% proficient and distinguished. But there are schools in the area that are doing much better. And just today, I went with the team, uh, myself, Jim Cook, Brooke Lingle, and Tina Ackles. Uh, we went and visited a school in the area that are trying some different things, and we're just trying to get ideas on what we can do. Uh, for us specifically, the way the percentage of our accountability breaks down, the science test, because we are a K-4 school, accounts for 40% of the school's assessment. Or if you look at the district results, the district does include fifth grade. Um, but for us, that test carries more weight than any of the other tests um, because we are K-4. So it is, it is very significant for us in terms of that accountability result. Um, what I am hoping to see is that our science scores would start coming more closely in line with what we're doing in that reading. Um, and we got some great ideas today. Uh, we're gonna take those back to the teachers and start discussing some of those ideas. And DLCs have already had a moment with Alex Moth, Dr. Baker, and uh, Rob and Michelle as well, and pretty excited about something. But uh, it is going to be a lot of work, and it is gonna take time. But I, 
think we have the right people in the right spots to be able to do that. Um, instead of looking at that test, one of the things I've been starting to say is, yes, it counts for 40%, um, but I want to stop looking at that as a liability against us, and it's an opportunity for us to, to make some huge strides at our school. Very pleased with that and reading. I'll go into the deeper stuff on that in the November board meeting, but the science test was the one thing where like, we're, we're going to hammer in on that uh, pretty significantly. Uh, and then the last thing is just a few dates that are coming up tonight. We've got Title One Parent Night. We've got people out of school right now. Uh, PTA Truck or Treat is going to be this weekend at the complex. Um, and then a couple other things. The Bearcat Breakfast, that will be a time where we're going to celebrate our volunteers at the beginning of the school year. Uh, it's a lot to get an elementary school off the ground and running. The little kids really need a lot of support. Uh, and we have an army of volunteers that come in and help, so we're going to celebrate them, feed them breakfast that day, and then I'm going to do my best to not bore them to tears, talking data crunching, and try to, you know, spice it up a little bit and interesting. But we're going to be talking about the results of our school report card uh, with the parents, let them ask me questions. Uh, and then uh, on November 10th, we're going to have a math and reading night for third and fourth grade. That's a Veterans Day theme. We got a list of veterans that are going to be coming, including my dad, uh, that's going to come and read to our students. Um, I'm very excited about that. It's not on the calendar there, but uh, December 1st, we'll be doing a K-1 and 2 night, and that's going to be a Winter Wonderland uh, theme. So a lot of things happening at the elementary school. Things are buzzing and, and going pretty well. Um, any questions for me? Thank you. Good evening. Um, I have just a brief snippet on uh, KSA. Uh, we're in the middle school, we're a little unique because we're five through eight. Uh, there's only one other in the area that I'm aware of. So when we look at us as a school, we were a green school, four tenths of a point from blue. So we're very proud of that. As a district middle school, which is six through eight, we were only one of three districts in Northern Kentucky that were blue. So we're very proud of that as well. So a little bit like uh, Blue was talking with, with the case of four and five to eight, they only need for us. Uh, but things are still overall looking good and I'll have more details uh, in a few weeks for the member meeting on KSA. I do want to shift over to the, the map data. Um, you know, I'm really happy with our fall map data, look at the growth, and that's what you see here, you look at a year's worth of growth. So fifth grade reading, when you see fall of 2021, that was the beginning of their fourth grade year, and the growth they made at the beginning of their fifth grade year. So a lot of this is credit to their fourth grade teachers. Um, the disadvantage for fifth graders is the significant amount of growth they are expected to make. Um, it's much different if you look down the line there on expected growth. I mean, almost eight points of growth and nine and a half points of growth in reading and math. Um, we weren't far off from that, and that number is getting bigger and bigger each time we're taking math since coming out of the pandemic. I mean, we were definitely, uh, this, this chart is a good indication of what happens when we have a full school year without really major interruptions to our students' growth. The other part of it is if you look down at fall 2022, that's our average student grid number. And every single one of those is green because they are above the national norm grid and in some areas pretty significantly above the national norm grid. And even some of that growth down there is significantly. Uh, I'm gonna use seventh grade math as an example. Our students made 10.7 points of growth from the beginning of their sixth grade year to the beginning of their seventh, which is uh, basically double what is expected and our eighth grade math is basically double. So that's a credit to a lot of what happened in sixth and seventh grade at the beginning of their seventh and eighth grade years. So you can see in a lot of those areas, we are far exceeding the growth. Free reduced lunch population, which is one of our subgroups, we've actually done really well there with growth. Special ed is still a struggle, but um, we are seeing some little positives there, but it is definitely our area of focus in the middle school, absolutely. The bottom chart, um, I'm more focused on the year long growth. This is just from spring of last year to fall of this year, and that's that summer digression. And if you notice, the expected growth areas are all negative expected growth, not big ones. And we were green in all but one of those, and we have seen traditionally here over the last three years 
math, especially with our younger students, has been a very big struggle for them. So um, not surprisingly, that's the one number that was a little bit, you know, it's a point lower than it should have been. Um, but that's better than it has been in the past. So this is strictly a look at math from the growth standpoint, and it's very positive because I really preach to the teachers that significant growth because then the uh, performance level is uh, impacted pretty positively from that growth. So that's really what I have this evening. We have a couple of events. Our uh, Veterans Day event, which Mrs. Hedges organizes very well, is coming up here in a couple of weeks. And if you are available, it is a nice event to attend at the, we're actually in the high school gym, but it's put on by uh, the middle school. So any questions for me? Give you the same presentation to the staff after the day came out. Only took 45 minutes. I will do my best to get through everything. Um, like all the other principals said, we're going to take a look at the uh, Kentucky Summative Assessment data. First, a little look at how that recipe is made into a meal. For us, 45% of our accountability comes from the 10th grade reading and the 10th grade math. 20% of our accountability comes from 11th grade science, 11th grade social studies, and the combined reading scores of on-demand and editing and mechanics. 5% comes from our EL uh, students. We do not have enough to make a group, so they take that out of our accountability and then they divide that 5% equally, uh, proportionally, amongst the other categories. Uh, climate culture. 10th grade and 11th grade take a survey of their schools, climate and culture, that's 4% uh, of our accountability. Um, we have the uh, transition readiness. Are they academic ready? Are they career ready? That's 20% of our accountability. And our graduation rate, both four and five year, that counts for 6% of our accountability. So in the yellow and the pink box, big proportion of our accountability comes from that 10th grade reading. 10th grade math, we made great uh, strides in there. You can see here, all students, our number at Walt Corona is the black number, all right? So all students in the most recent test, 70% of our uh, students scored proficient or distinguished um, compared to the state average of 44. In the math test, our students uh, scored proficient and distinguished at 58.2% of our kids scored proficient or distinguished. That is compared to the state average of 36. Compared to what we got last year was 39. So we saw a 20 point increase in the math scores there. So there is some calculation things going on behind the scenes, but also it is uh, what we're doing in the classroom that's paying off. Uh, a couple other principals talked about the science assessment. I'll let this sink in for a second. We had a student who scored in the 99th percentile of the science scores in the state. The state labels that proficient. That is not distinguished. 99th percentile is proficient. So our proficient and distinguished numbers on the science test is 15.6. Uh, it's not as high as we would like it. But that's kind of what we're dealing with, the struggle of where they set those cut scores. Our social studies, the first time they've seen that test, first time they took the test, first time we, or they've taken the file, but we got the data back now. Um, our proficient distinguished was 41.8%, uh, which is a really good number, um, but too much novice. Too many novices at the high school. Um, brand new this year, combined writing. Everybody knows on demand. They added a new test set called Editing and Mechanics. They put the two together to get this combined writing score. Um, so our combined writing score for all students was 51.6 proficient and distinguished, uh, which is much higher than the state uh, average of 38. Um, but we're still going to work on that. So I went through and I broke down. Okay, let's take a look at our on demand. I pulled those numbers out. Uh, this year we had 46%, 46.7% of our kids uh, scoring proficient distinguished. That number is off of last year's mark. Again, the calculations made behind the scenes of changing what proficient distinguished apprentice is. Um, so we can't compare apples to oranges, but overall the numbers need to improve. 
Um, and our editing mechanics, this is the first time the kids saw the test. The teachers had never saw the test before they walked in and students took this as a junior. 55% of our kids, almost 56, scored proficient in distinguished. We did really well in that test considering it's the first time the kids saw it. You know, we can't practice what they're going to test on. So uh, very pleased there. Our climate and culture of the school, 4%. Uh, we had a lot of really good answers. Kids can answer strongly, agree, agree, disagree, strongly, disagree. Uh, we've identified a couple areas that we didn't score as high as I would have liked to, and we've already implemented um, some things in our focus period to start those conversations, um, primarily about uh, how people perceive the opinions of others, um, which uh, we scored almost identical to what we did last year. Uh, but still not as high as I would like it. Overall, our kids rated us really high on they feel uh, safe in the building. There's somebody there to care for them. There's somebody there to go to when they need to talk to somebody, which is important. All right? Uh, one that I think we do a whale of a job at at the high school is our transition readiness. Um, I think we do a really good job for a school our size with our CTE programs, our relationship with the vocational school. Um, so for the class of 2022, 88.7% of our kids were transition ready. Um, that was a, a big number. We had six that received a bonus, all those coming from our students at the vocational school. They get the bonus for being uh, career ready, college ready, because they're taking dual credit, they're taking career classes, but they are high demand. Um, careers that they're certified to leave high school and get a job in. So uh, thank you, Laura Williams, at the vocational school for that. Um, something that the district really prides themselves on, our graduation rate, 99.4% graduation. Um, again, we keep coming back to that federal classification of the student um, in a special needs category stays until they're 21, where they need to be, is in school. That, uh, in terms of data breakdown, that is a dropout. Um, but we'll take that. That's where they need to be. They are, it's the right decision for the kid. We'll take it. Um, so, how did we do? State assessment results on the reading and math in the 10th grade. We scored a 79.9. That gave us a very high. State uh, assessment for science, social studies, and writing. They put that into one <coughs> big friendly number. That is a 56.9. That gives us a high. We did not have an EL score. Our quality and climate was in the very high, 68.5. Our post-secondary readiness, this is the one that kind of, um, you know, I looked at and said, wow, I, I thought we'd be higher with that, but the percentage that we got, uh, we were high, 89.7. I will say this, um, as of right now today, every single senior is transition ready as of today except nine of them. So we've already beat this number. Uh, this year, so I'm extremely proud of that, and we are working diligently with those nine students to give them one, two, three options to get that transition readiness indicator. Um, and of course, our graduation, 99.7, we uh, are very high there. This puts us at a final, final overall number of a 77.9. That is a green school, it is high. We missed very high by one tenth of a point. That's why we've identified some low-hanging fruit that we can do. We gotta get it done in the classroom, but we've identified some things we can do. Right now, our transition readiness numbers should mathematically put us in a very high category for next year. All right, after that, it gets into some you know, calculation stuff. You can see what I did there uh, at the end about what we're gonna do looking forward, moving on, that stuff we discussed with the staff. I'll save your time tonight, you can read that. Uh, any questions from the high school on Standards assessment. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, I do not have um, much to report on tonight. Our enrollment has not changed since I last reported to you guys. Um, the five students that were in RTI are still in RTI, and we're preparing to discuss their progress. Um, some highlights we did the trip to the pumpkin patch yesterday of all days, the only day of rain in months. It was funny, but that did not stop the people from having a great time. Um, and then I did just want to mention that the Dolly Parton Imagination Rec 
library. That registration is live now. So um, if you recall, that does provide one book per month for any um, student in our district in the county. In the county. Um, but one book per month from ages birth through five. So share that information. Social media, but um, it's a good question. So, questions for me? Thank you. <coughs> okay, um, moving along to our bridge program report. Um, numbers have kind of stayed about where they are or were as of last month, although we've Added a couple of new increases altogether, we kind of had a scratch in terms of total. Um, but our um, our kids are doing doing well. We've had of course we had fall break in this particular month, so uh, not quite as big of a number in the, down in the celebration area as, as you're probably used to. But all the same, we're still chugging along as kids are um, accumulating credits where they need to be. Accumulating credits. Uh, we did just um, um, receive a new student from outside of our school district um, just here recently, and um, a young man is experiencing difficulties in this early stage of life that he's in, but he's doing a really good job uh, with, with uh, Mike and Robbie and uh, Bill Craig before. Had some report coming in actually, and uh, we're just really, I'm really proud of that uh, this month. So um, he's off to a real good start. But overall, um, I feel very, very proud of the program this month. Um, again, it's been, been kind of a been kind of a light month in terms of news. So that's not all I have. Do you have any questions for me for the bridge program? <coughs>
uh, board members and, and those of you here with us this evening, I'm sure everybody's aware that last Thursday uh, we had an incident at our middle school. Uh, one of our middle school students found a nine millimeter shell uh, in a restroom. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Moore Wessel, Mr. Ridener, and Officer Gregory. Uh, they re reacted very quickly, searched uh, a total of 29 students, their backpacks, their lockers. They reviewed uh, video footage and e-hall pass footage for uh, data to determine which students had been in that restroom and handled the, the situation about as well uh, as they could have. Now, since then, we've received a little bit of feedback uh, from staff members, uh, and I'm sure, as always, this has been discussed on social media, uh, and the question has been posed, why didn't we move to a soft lockdown or any type of lockdown in the building once that bullet was found? Uh, so, Mr. Hartman and I, Mr. Hartman heads up our school safety uh, initiatives, contacted the Virginia <coughs> Sheriff's Office and the Kentucky Center for School Safety to get feedback uh, from them. And both organizations responded in writing with, uh, they believe that we acted appropriately, that a soft lockdown was not needed at that time. However, uh, we do have the discretion to do that as always. Uh, but the reason we didn't make a decision to move to a soft lockdown is because we didn't have uh, a reason to believe there was an imminent threat at that particular time. There was no evidence, no rumors, no, no indication whatsoever that there was a weapon in the building or that any kind of threats had been made. It, this just was found by a student in the restroom. And, and still to this day, uh, we don't know how it got there. Uh, I have suspicions that, you know, uh, someone realized they had that in their pocket and left it uh, to get rid of it because they knew it was obviously not something they should have in, have in the school. Uh, but again, uh, we acted appropriately uh, at the school level. Uh, we collaborated <coughs> with Boone County Sheriff's and the Kentucky Center for School Safety. We're always uh, welcoming and, and uh, receptive for feedback uh, from staff, parents, students. Uh, in keeping safety as our number one priority. Uh, I've been as open as honest about this as I can with the staff and the community, and we will continue to do so. I just want to thank everyone here, uh, not just for attending the meeting tonight, but also for your efforts and concern and, and helping us keep our schools as safe as humanly possible in this day and age. Any Moving on to 2G as an audience of citizens. We do have one, so that is uh, Matt Freeman. I want to speak about the uh, real construction, so if you would, you can. My uh, commentary is regarding the agenda topics that you took off with the construction. Do I still speak? Yeah, we didn't take we it didn't off. We didn't take them off. So you didn't? No. Yeah. So okay. if you want to come up and <coughs> take the podium, sure. Uh, if we can keep it to five minutes or less, that would be, that'd be great. And then, So yeah, it's my first time attending one of these. Um, uh, my wife Erica and I moved here about 18 months ago uh, into Walton, Verona. Uh, we have a high schooler and a middle schooler as well. Um, so, and my wife is also a substitute teacher here uh, at Walton, Walton, Walton Verona. Um, my question really was around, you know, the decision to award the contract to uh, the construction company that was awarded to. Um, my understanding is that you know it was an open bid process, and the bids were released earlier this week. Um, and my understanding is that perhaps there was a lower uh, contractor available. And as a taxpayer, my question really is around how a decision gets made uh, to not be the most fiscally responsible that we can be, and potentially award that to um, a different firm than who was the lowest bidder. So I, I'm in medical sales. I sell to. Uh, you know, government entities regularly, and they kind of know how this process works in my space. Um, I presume that it works similarly uh, in the school district, and so just as a taxpayer, my question is, you know, how did that decision get made? Who was the lowest bidder, and why was it not awarded to them? Um, I'll, I'll answer some of your questions. Uh, now, if you would like, I can submit to you a written response to all of your questions uh, tomorrow, maybe Monday. Okay. What I can share with you is this. We are required to award a bid, uh, award the contract to the best bid, not the lowest bid, okay? What I can tell you in short is that I'm aware that we're dealing with public money. We're dealing with taxpayer funds. And I'm not willing to gamble with taxpayer funds. 
I want to recommend to this board a, a contract that I am very confident in the company's ability and proven track record to complete a project of this type and this size. Is there a checklist that you can share for how those were evaluated there against is, each other? There is a rubric and I'd be happy to share that with you. And it'll be made public record? I would, yeah. yeah. It is I mean, I'm sure all the taxpayers would love that. It is public record. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you.
judgment does.